Greetings, folks. Uh, it's a privilege, of course, to do this for Claremont, as you might imagine. You know, my love to all you folks. Um, somebody asked about my mask. You can get these online. I, I'm not selling them, so I have nothing to sell. You'll have to search for yourself. Various scripture verses. This is really a pretty good one, though. I mean, not that any other scripture verse isn't good, but uh, faith over fear, Psalm 118.6. The Lord is on my side. You know, whom shall I fear? I'm not going to fear what man can do unto me. So that's a pretty good one to be able to communicate in today's world where there's a lot of fear out there, fear of the unknown, fear of the known. But we can communicate our hope we have in the gospel and in Christ, what he's done, and uh, where our confidence really lies. You may recognize Psalm 118, some of you, as having in our English Bibles, many of our English Bibles, what uh, is the middle verse of the Bible which is, I'll, you know, our trust is in the Lord, and uh, we put no confidence in man. So it's an excellent psalm, and uh, uh, anyway, you can get whatever kind of mask you like, but you never know. One can maybe lead to some opportunities. So it's good to be with you again. I want to turn to something that will do, in a sense, a, a sense of injustice to you, uh, and may do injustice to you because you may not have been in this section of scripture for a long time. And I will confess to you that uh, returning from Pennsylvania last week and uh, stopping by uh, Martinez, Georgia, which is just outside of Augusta to speak on Sunday, this was a passage of scripture that they asked me to take up in their adult Sunday school. And then I continued to preach on it during the Bible hour. And uh, it sort of clicked with me. I think it has a relevancy for where we're at, at least in my mind it does. And uh, we'll see how the Lord works, but uh, it's, a, it's an exceptional message really. And I think you'll understand when we look at it. So what I'd like you to do is if you have your Bible and you're following along, long, turn to the book of Esther in chapter six. Esther chapter six. It's only 14 verses, so I'm going to take the liberty to go ahead and read them because it's always good to hear the Word of God. And if you can follow along visually, it's good to take it in through the eye gate as well as the ear gate. So I'm going to read from Esther chapter 6 and verse 1. On that night could not the king sleep, and he commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hold on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, There's nothing done for him. And the king said, Well, who is in the court? Now Haman was come into the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's servant said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in. And the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, to whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself? And Haman answered the king, Well, for the man whom the king delighteth to honor, let the royal apparel be brought, which the king useth to wear, and the horse th that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head. And let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man with all whom the king delighteth to honor, and bring him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Make haste, and take apparel in the horse, as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. Then took Haman the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and brought him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaimed before him, 
Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor. Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but Haman hasted to his house mourning and having his head covered. And Haman told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had befallen him. Then said his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, unto him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but shalt surely fall before him. And while they were yet talking with him, came the king's chamberlains and hasted to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared. <laughs> it's a fascinating story, isn't it? And if you know the story, I trust you do, but it's a really, uh, uh, we're kind of, kind of breaking in at the climax uh, to the story where the situation is gonna change a little bit. But uh, I want to just refresh your mind by remembering of what's going on at this particular time. So there are seven books that are linked in the Bible by time chronology, the time frame in which they fit. They basically have to do with the time of exile of the people of God who were carried away into captivity because of their disobedience to God and their sinfulness and God's judgment upon them which had been forewarned. And uh, some of them have to deal with the post-captivity period. But there are seven books that you can remember that are linked together. And the reason why I'm saying that is we uh, have to realize that in our Bibles, the book of Esther is the last of the historical books in our Bible before we get to the books of poetry, Job, Psalms, and so on. But thinking about that time frame. There are three books that are historical and give us the history of that period. And those are the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Then there are three prophetic books or three prophets that are linked to that period. Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Then there's one book that is both historical and prophetic, and that's the book of Daniel. All of those seven books are linked together in this particular time frame. And there are certain things that you will find that are similar uh, within that, those books because of the time frame. For instance, you remember the subject of the changing of names. So while if I asked people in certain audiences or said to them, well, Tonight, we're going to learn the story of Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah. A lot of folks will go, huh? But if I said, oh, we're going to learn the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they'd go, oh, okay. So it's interesting that those names were changed. The Hebrew names are not as well known as the Babylonian names that were given to those young men. Although, interestingly enough, in that same book, Daniel was given a name of a pagan god, but he is normally referred to as Daniel. And so when you come to the book of Esther, this was a name that was given to her. Her name was Hadassah in the Hebrew, but they gave her the name Esther. And whether they gave it to her to represent the god of Ishtar or some other meaning, not 100% positive, but I point that out to notice the similarity uh, between those times of exile books, Esther, Daniel, and so on. Now, one of the things that's very significant about the book of Esther, highly significant, particularly with the passage that we come to tonight, is that it is one of only two books in the entire word of God that does not mention the name of God. This is very significant. Only two books that do not mention God's name. One is the book of Esther. And the other, well, Russ could tell us or Dave could tell us, would be the Song of Solomon, in case you just needed a refresher on your memory there. But anyway, two books in the Bible that don't mention God's name. But though God's name is not mentioned, it'll become very clear that God is actively working behind the scenes. And that's one of the most significant things in my mind 
not only about the book of Esther, but about this particular chapter tonight. It's also interesting that in this book, there's no mention of prayer. Now, if you know the story of an edict being issued to exterminate all of the Jewish people in the land, they fasted, they mourned, we can assume they probably did pray, but prayer is not mentioned in this book. Just another little thing to tuck away in our memory when we think about this particular book. It is from this book that eventually there is a feast established. And so I'm gonna throw you another Tuesday out there. I said the first Tuesday was two books in the Bible, name of God not mentioned, Esther, Song of Solomon. Here's another Tuesday. Two festivals or feasts that are practiced by the Jews, the Orthodox Jews, that had no basis in the Levitical law or the law of Moses. One is the Feast of Purim, which develops out of the book of Esther, and the other, Hanukkah, or the Festival of Lights. Neither of those have basis in the Mosaic law, and yet they're practiced by the Orthodox Jews even to this day. Just one of those little interesting things. And then I'm gonna give you one threesy to throw in there, okay? Gave you the twosies, now here's the threesy. <laughs> you could think about the book as divided uh, in reference to three feasts. There's the Feast of Ahasuerus, which is at the beginning of the book. Then there's the feast that Esther plans and in initiates. And then eventually the Feast of Purim, which is established towards the end of the book. So the whole book revolves around those three feasts. And you remember perhaps the plot that the queen of Vashti in the early chapters had been dethroned because of a refusal to appear before the king and his cohorts. Uh, these people threw feasts. Now, when I say they threw feasts, I mean, you have at Claremont wonderful, I'm not sure what California calls them. I've heard them called a lot of things. You know, we have potluck dinners. We have dinners on the ground, which sounds better than dinner on the grounds. Uh, and uh, we have all sorts of names for them, fellowship feast, yak and snack, whatever. But y'all have wonderful ones there at Claremont, okay? Gab and flab, you know how it works. But man, these people threw something for six months, okay? They didn't mess around. They had a feast that was six months long. And then when you just figured feast was enough feast, then they had a seven days, a really big feast, okay? And it was during that time that Vashti was called to appear before the king refused to do it. There may have been lewd, um, uh, you know, inferences uh, suggested there, for whatever reason, she uh, refused to do it. And so she was dethroned. And that leads to Mordecai, who was the adopted father, though kind of a cousin of Esther, who'd also been deported with the other Jews, who were there in the country, by the way, called Persia here, but that we know as the land of Iran today, under a supreme ruler, Ahasuerus, sometimes called Xerxes. And so um, the characters begin to emerge. Whenever you have a good plot and a good story, you got characters. So we've got King Ahasuerus, we've got Mordecai, we have Esther, and we have a man named Haman. Now, I'm not going to take the time today to go into the history of Haman fully in detail, except to mention a few things to you to trigger your thinking, because we find in Scripture certain characteristics of nations. And while we would be careful to say things like, well, we wouldn't want to say like, you know, all Scots are tight, okay? We wouldn't want to say that, you know, because some of us know Scots that aren't tight, okay? But there are certain national characteristics sometimes that are associated with nations, just a fact. I mean, scripture says it. Cretans, <laughs> they're all liars and slow bellies, you know? It's just a national uh, detriment to them or whatever. But having said that, 
The more important point is that as certain characters emerge in scripture, you begin to trace their history and you begin to see something ominous with some of these characteristics. So when you take Haman, Haman uh, in chapter three is called Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite. So he is an Agagite. And when you begin to go back over that history, you realize that the origination of the Agagites was through Amalek. Amalek was a descendant of Esau. Esau, who was also called Edom. Now, I, I'm getting old, as you can tell, by looking at the space above my head or what's missing and whatever else. But anyway, um, I can't always remember where I said whatever, so I just usually say it again. It is what it is. I think I might have made this statement at Claremont, but I can't verify it. But the statement is this. When you take Esau in scripture, it is undeniable according to the scriptural evidence that Esau was the first redneck, okay? Um, his, his nickname was Red. That's what Edom means. He was a hairy chested man, chest full of red hair. He hunted with a bow and arrow. He killed deer. He ate chili, beans with red stuff, okay? So Esau undoubtedly is the first redneck in scripture. Now, having said that, one of the things that differentiates Esau between, between Jacob is their appetites. Esau only was concerned with immediate gratification. Give me that red stuff. I'm about to die, which wasn't true. He wasn't about to die. I don't care anything about the birthright. That's all pie in the sky by and by. Not interested. I'd trade it for a bowl of chili. The scripture says Esau despised his birthright. Jacob, con man that he was, he had an interest in spiritual things. He may have gone about it wrong trying to get them, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the big differentiation. And so you begin to trace that line down through scripture. You find that the Amalekites opposed the people of God in the book of Numbers would not allow them passage, nor would Edom through their land. The Israelites came and they said, look, give us passage through your land. We won't drink your water. We won't graze our cattle. We won't take your food. And they're like, nothing doing. You're not coming through here. They opposed the people of God. You come on down to the book of 1 Samuel, and one of Saul's biggest failures was his failure to exterminate the king Agag. God had commanded him to do that. And you remember, he did not do it. That comes back again when you find in 1 Samuel 21, there was a man named Doeg, and you see he was of that same lineage. And you remember it was Doeg that stepped in to slay the priest when David had come and partaken of the showbread and so on and so on. And so this line is consistent all through scripture. Flesh, opposition to God, haters of the people of God. It even follows through to the New Testament. When the Lord Jesus was born and they came to the king. You remember, name was Herod. In the New Testament Greek, it says he was an Idumean. It means he was an Edomite. And he slaughtered all of the children that were two years old and under. Same characteristics. So now you have Haman, who rises to a level in the king's court, a responsible position before the king, an advisor to the king. And Haman's got this huge problem. Obviously, he's a man who's prideful, and he likes his place and position. And when everybody else in the kingdom bowed to Haman, there was one person at least who didn't, and it was Mordecai the Jew. Mordecai the Jew would not bow 
would not reverence Haman the king. And it infuriated him to the point where he cooked up a plot. His plot was, king, you know, there's a people in this land and they don't observe your laws and they're not really loyal to you. And really the only thing we can do is we need to purge the land of all these people, you know. And King, well, I, I, I feel so strongly about this that I tell you, I'd be, I'd be willing to fund this campaign. I'll give you the silver even to have it done. And so the plot is set in action to exterminate all of the Jewish people in the land. And Haman, of course, erects this great set of gallows upon which Mordecai will be particularly uh, executed. Everything is in motion. When finally, you remember that Mordecai appeals to Esther and she hears what he has to say and she ultimately confesses those tremendous words at the end of chapter four. As Mordecai says to her, it may be for such a time like this that you have come to the kingdom. Who knows, but for such a time as this, God has raised you up to the kingdom. And she finally says at the end of her statement in verse 16, if I perish, I perish. Because there was a law in effect at that time, the way that the supreme ruler Ahasuerus said, that unless he extended to you the golden scepter, you could not approach into the inner circle of the court's kingdom, you could not approach the court unless the king invited you by extending the golden scepter. And if you came any other way, death. And so we'll think about that in a moment. Now, maybe your mind is fast forwarding and and thinking a little bit to the future, and that's perfectly legitimate, because obviously, in all of these books, you'll find another a consistent thing, won't you, with what you find in the book of Esther, and what you find in, for instance, the book of Daniel. The attempt at the extermination of God's people at that time, the nation of Israel, and how God preserved, like he did Daniel, like he did Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego through that fiery furnace, and like he ultimately do with Esther and all of the nation that was alive in the land of Persia in that day. And that's a remarkable thing to think about. There's coming a time that the Bible tells us about in the book of Revelation that is also referred to in other places such as Jeremiah and elsewhere as the time of Jacob's trouble. And while it'll have an effect worldwide, and while there'll be non-Jewish people affected by it, it has been particularly designed as the time of Jacob's trouble. And there will be an attempt at the extermination, again, the genocide of all of the Jewish people, because not because of who they are, but because of what they represent, God's covenant, God's promises, and God's stated publicly stated purpose of what he has in plan for that nation of Israel. It's very critical to, to remember that in our thinking, in our theology, and so on. And it'll be a time of preservation. There'll be many that will be preserved through that time of tribulation. 144,000 at least will be preserved and, and, and unharmed through that time. So there's tremendous prophetic portent as we think about what taking place, what's taking place in the book of Esther. One of the big lessons that I see, and we'll see if the Lord speaks to your heart that way, certainly has to do with providence. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm certainly not a Latin scholar. Matter of fact, I'm not a scholar at all. I do get by with English of a Southern variety. Southern meaning not Southern California, but Southern United States, okay? So uh, forgive me for my perhaps mispronunciation. But our word providence comes and has its roots in a Latin word, providere. And what it means is to see something beforehand. We would transliterate that into English 
pro video, like seeing the thing unplayed before it actually happens, which lends itself to a very similar word to provide. So in providence, God sees beforehand, obviously, what is going to unfold and is able to, provi to provide for that contingency or situation or whatever it may be. I hope that makes sense. The main thing we remember in the book of Esther is that all that this happens is not coincidence. It is divine providence. And though God is not up front in the forefront, his name's not even mentioned. And though these people have been disobedient to him and judgment has fallen, they've been carried off into the land. Uh, part of the exile has already taken place or the return has already taken place. When you add up all of the phases of the different returns, you only get 50 something thousand people that ever went back to rebuild the wall and the temple and the land. Some of them rather stay in, in Iran, more comfortable there. Had it pretty good for some of them, you see. Whatever reason, even though this people had not joined those who returned, God was providentially watching over caring for his people. I'll tell you, it didn't seem like it at the time. I mean, they were up against it. This edict had gone forth. It was, the, things were put into motion and it looked like they were going to be wiped out. But God working providentially behind the scenes. Something had taken place prior to all of this. It's actually found in chapter two. And, and I'll turn there to read it for you. What it was, was a plot. It says in chapter two, verse 21, in those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bigthan and Teresh, of, whose, of those who kept the door. So now these were people who kept the king's chamberlain and door. Imagine this, you're the king. You got to have somebody guarding you while you sleep. This is like your secret service. This is your inner circle. These are your most trusted, you know, protectors. And they were wroth. And they, were, they, they set up an assassination plot to kill the king. And just so happened that of all the people to hear about the assassination plot was Mordecai who told Esther the queen, she told the king in Mordecai's name, and when they made inquiry, inquisition, the matter was found out, they were both hanged on a tree, and it, it just so happened, it was such an important event, they said, we should record this in the book of the Chronicles of the king, and they did. Fast forward now, chapter six. It just so happened that on a certain night, the king, he couldn't sleep. He had a case of insomnia. Now, you're the king of 127 provinces, you know. You got all kind of sleep aid means if you need them, you see, to help you get to sleep that night. But the king did what other people have done when they've had insomnia. He called for the books the book of the records of the Chronicles of the Kings. Now, I don't know what form those books were in, whether they were in, you know, clay tablets, whatever they were. I was reminded though of something that, that uh, took place in the days of the Lord Jesus. It's actually found in Luke chapter four. It's what I call the Lord's first sermon in his hometown. So he goes back to Nazareth, he goes to the synagogue, on the Sabbath day, as custom was in that day in the synagogue, he goes into the synagogue and he could read and the minister of the synagogue hands him the scrolls to read. And he opens up to the book of Isaiah, chapter 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, give sight to the blind, et cetera, et cetera. You know the story. And then to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he sat down. All eyes were upon him. Now, it's interesting because remember that in that day, they did not have a book like we have. No chapters and verses. 
no, you know, punctuation marks. It was a scroll read right to left for the Jewish people. Do you know that the scroll of Isaiah that was found in, in Qumran in the Dead Seas was almost 28 feet long? 28 feet long. So they did what they still do in custom to this day in certain synagogues. They, they rolled the scroll, they finished it, they put it back in what's called the ark. The next Sabbath day, you pull it out. Now, it isn't like you turn and say, okay, I'm going to turn out Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. No, he just happened to open the scroll at the very place where it was found and told those people as he read the scriptures, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. In other words, I'm the fulfillment of that. Amazing to us, but the Lord knew, walked into the synagogue at that time, took the scroll out at that place and read it. Why do I say that? Because bring me a book. And what book did they bring him? Well, bring me something really boring. Read to me the court records. That'll be pretty boring. That'll put me to sleep. They just happened to bring him that book at that time and turn to that place where, lo and behold, it recorded what Mordecai had done five years ago to save the life of the king. Five years had passed since that event had taken place. What a coincidence. Not. Then the king says, what's been done to the man who, who did this to save the king's life? Well, nothing. Well, see who's standing outside. Well, it just so happened at that very moment that Haman happened to be standing outside. What a coincidence, you see, that Haman's standing outside. Well, bring him in, and let's ask him the question. What would be done to honor the man whom the king delights? Wasn't all just coincidence, was it? None of it was coincidence. All the time that had gone by. You know, we think about that verse in the New Testament. And it's a wonderful, it's been called a pillow of comfort for the people of God. Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for the good, for those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. Think about that for a moment. All things work together. Here's the problem as I see it. Sometimes if we take single events in isolation, they don't seem to make sense. Whether it's an event in our personal life or an event in the whole scope of what's going on in the world, isolated events taken on their own don't seem to make sense. But when we see them in the bigger picture. You know, my, uh, my great-grandmother, I'm sorry, my grandmother, uh, not my great-grandmother, but my grandmother, she, uh, it's a long story, I won't go into the whole details, so she got saved when she was in her 80s, had the privilege of baptizing her, I think she was 82, which was a real treat, but anyway, um, she used to sit at home all day after her husband died, and she did needlepoint, very fine petty point, she used to do um, uh, upholstery for chairs and benches and things like that. But later in life, she did these massive, big, uh, very expensive tapestries. And they would be, you know, different artist depictions of certain scenes. And she'd sit there and do them all day long and into the night, doing these fine petty point, needle point, making these pictures out of thread. She'd finish one, she'd take it into a room in the house, she'd throw it on the table, and she'd start another one. I always think of her and those things because when you went into that room where those tapestries were, if you looked at it because she just flopped them over the table, it just looked like a jumbled up mess of thread. It didn't seem to make any sense. And it always reminds me of that poem, which some of you probably know, it's called The Divine Weaver. My life is but a weaving between my Lord and me. I cannot choose the colors. He worketh steadily. 
Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride. Forget that he sees the upper, and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent, and the shuttle cease to fly, will God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. And I want to tell you, that's how life can be. We see the jumbled up threads. God sees the upper side. We see the dark threads. The divine weaver knows exactly what colors to weave. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper, and I the underside. One day that canvas will be unveiled, and we'll see the pattern of how all things, not in isolation, but all things work together for the good and for the glory of God. I love the, uh, the poem, it's a hymn by Cowper. <clears throat> and I don't know whether you know this, William Cowper was a contemporary of John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, many other hymns. William Cowper was in such deep depression, he attempted suicide by drowning. But that same man penned these words. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take, the clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. And then I just, this verse just blows me away. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. And you see that in this book of Esther, don't you? That behind what seemed to be a frowning providence, a people in judgment, under the gun, oppressed by foreign nations, removed from their homeland, exiled, many of their loved ones killed, put to death, and so on. And now an edict goes forth that will destroy all of them. Where was God? Behind a frowning providence. He hides a smiling face. And so, through this series of not coincidences, but providence, you see, God behind the scenes is working. And so when Haman puts forth his proposal, of course, thinking all the time, well, who else would the king delight to honor but me? And because of his pride, which goes before destruction, you see. Yes, oh well. <clears throat> and, and it's amazing, the king, sometimes you think, king, what are you thinking, you know? He wants your horse, your gown, your crown. Sounds like he wants to be king and you're gonna go for it? But that's the way it worked. And yet, would love to see the look on Haman's face when the king said, capital idea, go and do that for Mordecai. <laughs> and parade him through the street, you see, the one that Haman hated more than anybody else. And, and say, this is what will be done to the one in whom the king delights to honor. <laughs> Wonderful to think about, isn't it? Five years go by. Mordecai's deed unknown, apparently. Unrewarded for five years. And yet that reward came, didn't it? In the right time. 
The verse of the New Testament I love, it's found in Colossians 3.24, and it says, you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. I'll tell you, for you and I who are believers, it may be five years, it may be more that goes by. The world may never recognize, and obviously, we don't care if it does. But God has it recorded in his books. And at the right time, he's going to record accordingly. He'll reward. He takes note of all that is done. Which reminds me again of recorded events. There was a book of the Kings of the Chronicles. And everything that people had done, good or bad, had been recorded in those books. That's interesting, isn't it? I want to tell you in life, nobody gets away with anything. When I turn to the book of the Revelation in chapter 20, I read these, when I say awesome, I don't mean awe-inspiring. I mean almost terrible in the old English sense of the word. It's found in Revelation 20, 12. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Everything had been recorded. I won't take the time to go into it now, but if you'd like the references for later, Matthew 11, 20 through 24, and Luke 12, 44 through 48, that speak about the varying degrees of punishment. You'll notice that in Matthew 20, 12, that they are judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. But there's two sets of books, if you will. One that records everything that you'd ever done. But follow me carefully. It's a very important, critical distinction and another evidence of the very accuracy of the word of God of Scripture. And it's verse 15. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Those that are cast into the lake of fire are not cast into there because of their works, good or bad. They don't stand before God to see whether or not they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. The books that have their works written in them are to determine the degree of punishment that they, they will, in, 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 will endure. But what determines whether or not they're cast into the lake of fire is the other book. And an awful blank that seems to be there as we read this passage, because their name is not found written in the book of life, cast into the lake of fire. Is your name written there on the page, white and fair? You'll not enter heaven because of what good works you've done. You'll not be barred from heaven from what bad works you've done. You'll be cast into a lake of fire if your name is not found written in the book of life. And the only way your name can be there is for you to come to that place where you realize that you have sinned and you need a savior. And God has provided that savior in the Lord Jesus. And unless you trust the Lord Jesus as savior, you die and go out of this world unsaved. You're going to stand one day there and you're going to have to have that awful pronouncement that your name is not found written in the book of life. And you'll be cast forever into the lake of fire. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. If you're not saved, right now, you can come to the Lord Jesus. You can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the scripture says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you can be saved. And if you're not saved and you're listening today, now's the time. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Everything's been recorded. Oh, how wonderful to know that your name is recorded in the Lamb's book of life. It leads me to one other thing as we kind of prepare to wind down. It's found in Hebrews chapter 10. I couldn't help get away from, I couldn't get away from thinking about the, um, the recording in the books. And in Hebrews chapter 10, 
I want to say here, and this is very important, don't take my word for it. And I'll, sh I'll show you what I mean in Hebrews 10, 15. Wherefore, the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. So don't take my word for it, because the Holy Spirit's going to now step up and testify. And what is the testimony and witness of the Holy Spirit? Well, here's what he says. For after that he had said before, this is a covenant I'll make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where there's that kind of a sacrifice, you don't need any more offering for sin. If you find something that'll do that, your sins and iniquities, I'll remember no more. Why do I bring this up here? Well, never think that God, the Almighty, ever develops some form of dementia or Alzheimer. God does not sit up in heaven one day and say, now let me see. Now that Larry Price, now he was a rascal. I know he did some things, but I just can't for the life of me recall what that was. Not the Almighty. No, it's highly more significant than that. It isn't that God has a forgetter. No. It's legal terminology. And it's very similar to the, to the chronicles of the kings, the books of the records in the time of Ahasuerus. And what it says then is that their sins and iniquities I'll remember no more. In a judicial way, if, if the king, for instance, were to call for the book of all that you had done, of everything that was against you, in God's moral court, the books are open, and guess what? <laughs> You're all clear. There's no case against you. Case dismissed. Nothing against this person. The record is clear, justified sanctified in the very sight of Almighty God through the death of his son and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, you see. Wonderful thing, you see. God opens those books, and that's, that's where you want to find a blank, you see. Not in the book of life, where your name is to be recorded. And so what a wonderful thing. And then, again, don't take my word for it. It's the Spirit of God who testifies that there. There's one last thing I want to mention about the book of Esther, the chapter particular that we have, but the book as a whole. And it's remarkable. I'm going to give you one more twosie, okay? Remember our other twosies. There's two books where the name of God's not mentioned. There's two festivals that are not found in the Mosaic Law, still practiced by the Jewish people. And there's two books in the Bible that are named for women. One is Ruth, and one is Esther. Both remarkable when we think about it. But coming back to the book of Esther, and she makes that famous statement at the end of chapter 4. If I perish, I perish. Mordecai, Uncle Mordecai, you know that the king has this policy, and if I go before his court, and he does not hold out the golden scepter, well, I'm dead. But I'm willing to give my life, if that's what it takes, in order to save the nation. Remarkable that a woman would say that, isn't it? It reminds us of the Lord Jesus, the one who was the ultimate substitutionary sacrifice, willing to give his life to save not just the nation of Israel, but all who would come to him by faith. And I want to tell you, one of the only things that blocks you, and it's the root of everything that would block you, is that same thing I briefly alluded to earlier from the book of Proverbs, that pride goes before destruction. We see it in Haman, don't we? And that'll block you from God's salvation. It'll block you from the blessing of God in your life. Don't let it do so today. The Lord Jesus gave his life, not just to save the nation of Israel, but to save you and whosoever will would come to him by faith and believe on him and trust him as Savior and Lord. And while we look at a world that seems to be spinning out of control in so many ways, and pandemic and 
all of the other things that are taking place, there's a God who providentially is working. This, this book of Esther reminds me of that, that place in the scripture. He that keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. God has not fallen asleep on the job, okay? He is still in control. And he's going to work all of these things together. Not just isolated incidents, but all things together for our good and ultimately for his glory.